Good morning, Michael. Good morning. Thank you so much for being here on Michelle's Conversations That Matter. I'm thrilled to have you. I've been a fan of your great work that I have been um, watching all over uh, social media. You are a stand for employee burnout, and that's a topic that's um, near and dear to my heart with the mental health work that I do. So thank you for saying yes to being on Michelle's Conversations That Matter. Well, thank you so much for the invite. I'm looking forward to our conversations today. Awesome. So um, a little bit about this series. So I launched Ms. Michelle's Conversations That Matter to cause more open conversation. As you know, you're, you, you're in the mental health space. We need more open, unapologetic discussions about mental health. So I'm causing those through this series. I am out to inspire, educate, motivate people. Um, and, and go there, have those awkward discussions that people might not be comfortable with. So um, I'm thrilled that you said yes with my company. What I'm out to do is help uh, there be more compassion around invisible disabilities and have employees be more engaged and empowered around their well-being overall. So that's what I'm doing um, in, my, in my day job. But um, we're going to talk about employee burnout today. This is a really important topic because prior to COVID, I think we used to relate to employee burnout as that place you go mm -hmm. and you get in your car and you go to that place. And that's the place where, you know, you got to be careful. But, you know, since COVID hit, we're now seeing statistics here in the U.S. that one in three are suffering from um, either anxiety or depression. Um, this is not familiar. Nobody has navigated a pandemic. And we're in this work from home mode. So I'm excited to dive into this conversation because I would have never thought you could have burnout working from home, right? You're working from home, but you have an entire um, bit to tell us about that. But before we dive in, can you, Mike, introduce yourself and tell us who you are, where you live, and what you do? Yeah, Michael Levitt, um, the founder and chief burnout officer of the Breakfast Leadership Network. It's an organization that works with organizations and individuals on burnout. Uh, and burnout has been around for a long time. It's not something that's new, but it's definitely getting a lot more awareness over these past few months uh, because, as you indicated, working from home burnout is a huge problem. And even you know, there's several studies we can mention uh, during our chat today. Uh, one in particular, monster.com did a survey uh, and those surveyed indicated that 69% of people surveyed indicate that they're going through some type of burnout. So if you're an organization, those statistics mean seven out of 10 of your people are burned out right now. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a pandemic within a pandemic. That is a huge problem. And historically organizations have kind of ignored employee wellness. I know some people may disagree, uh, but they've ignored it. Handing them an EAP brochure and say, here you go, is not uh, addressing the mental well-being of your employees. Yeah. And if you've got seven out of 10 people burning out, that's a huge problem. And many organizations, unfortunately, don't pay any attention to it because it hasn't impacted the bottom line. But it will because colleagues that I talk to that are in the insurance space have indicated that this year, the mental health claims and against insurance policies are skyrocketing. So guess what? Next year, everybody's premiums are going to be going up. So that impacts the bottom line. And especially if you see, okay, well, we've had 180% increase in mental claims on our insurance policy. And if they have a significant enough raise in their mm -hmm. premium costs, that's going to be an outlier on their financial statement for those that read those things. Yeah. I'm originally an accountant, so I understand them. Mm -hmm. And what will happen is because it's going to be a big increase, it's going to show up as a variance and saying, what is this? And it's going to show up on financial statements and it's going to show up in annual reports. Mm -hmm. Investors are going, why did you have such a huge increase in your insurance costs? They're going to be digging in and all of a sudden it's going to say, it's because your employee ranks are stressed and going out on medical leave and mental leave. Yeah. And all of a sudden the organizations are going to be saying, wait a minute, what, what are you doing to your employees to burn them out? Then you have a PR nightmare on top of if yeah. it's a publicly traded organization, the stock prices start plummeting because investors are going, they're not running their organization well, and it can create a real bad mess for an organization. So we're starting to see some organizations 
get ahead of this. Not enough, but we're mm -hmm. starting to see some to go, we need to do something more than just say, here's our EAP program. We really need to take a proactive approach and bring in organizations uh, like yourself and myself to educate their employees and their management. Okay, this is how you can prevent burnout. This is how you can address some things because if you don't, seven out of 10 people, you know, you, that impacts your bottom line, not only from higher insurance, right. but productivity, the quality yeah. of your products or services and everything like that. So, yeah. Yeah. So I, um, I am always the curious one as to why you care. Can you give mm -hmm. us some story behind why you care so much about burnout? Sure. Yeah. Back in 2009, I, and actually let's go back to 2007. I started as a healthcare executive for a startup healthcare organization just outside of Windsor, Ontario, which is across the border from Detroit. I'm a dual citizen, uh, born in the U.S., immigrated to Canada in 2004, uh, became a citizen in 2011. And I joke with people that gives me the right to vote and screw up two countries. Then I leave it there. I don't say anything else about that because uh, <laughs> I don't want to upset anybody, and I'm not saying who I vote for. I never do. Um, I never. I'm never public. But it, it's with great power comes great responsibility. So I, I, I take it very carefully. And yes, I have voted. My um, my ballot arrives today uh, in the last place that I lived at in the states. So I, I, I have voted in the United States election. Again, I won't tell you how I vote, other than I, I could share on how I vote for judges. But well, that's another story yeah. for another day. But. Um, uh, but anyway, uh, back in 2007, I was hired as this healthcare executive, and I was working some insane hours. And for many people that have worked in a startup, they know there's a lot of hours involved. Mm -hmm. uh, but this wasn't my startup. I was an employee mm -hmm. of this startup, and I was basically working from 6 a.m. to 11 p.m. seven days a week because I was getting emails and messages and hiring staff and recruiting physicians and educating the community why our clinic was better than other clinics, working with funders to get funding um, for the clinic and mm -hmm. all of that. And did that for two solid years and it took a toll on me and I was not taking care of myself. Self-care was not even in the equation. Uh, I wasn't eating properly. I wasn't getting any exercise to speak of. Um, was not resting, was not sleeping well. And it all came to uh, what I like to refer to as my year of worst case scenarios that kicked off in May of 2009. I was mowing my front lawn on a Monday and I had an electric mower, which was bulky uh, to do. So as I'm mowing the lawn, I was turning to start mowing the next row. And then I, when I turned the lawn mower, I felt a really sharp pain in the center of my chest and it really hurt. I felt like I pulled a muscle because again, the, the lawnmower was bulky. I couldn't finish mowing lawn. So I went in the house, I took some Tylenol and the pain subsided. But what I noticed was anytime I lifted anything up with my right arm, that pain would come back. I'm left-handed, so I don't tend to lift things with my right arm too much, but this proceeded for several days. Fast forward to the Thursday evening, I went out to dinner at a local restaurant, had a coupon, and basically ate three human beings worth of food. Uh, it was the deep fried, greasy, really tasty, definitely not good for you type of food. Mm -hmm. And I ate a ton because I was saving so much money and it was just, it was like delicious and I loved it. I get home, go to bed. I wake up around 1030 at night with that pain that I had Monday, but it was I would say at least 50 times more impactful. It really hurt. You know, it felt like an elephant was stepping on my chest and I blamed it on gas and indigestion from eating all of that greasy fried stuff. So I took some Tums and I was able to fall asleep Friday morning. I wake up that pain is persistent. It's not going away. So I get into the office and I talk to our lead physician at the clinic and I said, uh, um, having these pains and explain the situation. He said, well, let's just listen. So he listened and he's like, it's probably nothing, but let's go ahead and hook you up because we had EKG equipment at our clinic. Uh -huh. So let's go ahead and hook you up, run some tests, just make sure everything's okay. So I go back in the procedure room, our physicians there, our lead nurse is there, uh, admin assistant person was there. They're all laughing hysterically because their boss is taking off his clothes in front of them, stripped down to my underwear. 
they're having a blast with it, making all kinds of harassment jokes. I'm as red as a tomato. I'm not thinking about anything other than here I am taking my clothes off in front of employees. Not something you should be doing on a normal <laughs> basis, but here I am. Mm -hmm. And once all that done, they, they hooked up all the equipment to uh -huh. me and they ran the test and they were perplexed. And I said, you know what? We're going to run it again. We're going to reconnect all the uh, electrodes to you and, and then run the test again because it looks weird. Uh -huh. So they ran it again and they got the same results. So they faxed the results to Dr. Gina, who was at Hotel Du Grace Hospital in Windsor. And a few minutes later, Dr. Gina called and told him, tell Michael to get his butt in the hospital right now and he can't drive. Oh but, my gosh. So basically what had happened is I had a pretty significant heart attack. Um, I had two blockages in my left interior descending artery, which for those that are familiar with cardiology, they refer to that artery as the widow maker. Mm -hmm. typically if you have blockages in that artery and you have a heart attack, you don't survive. Here we are in October of 2020. Here I am. So I'm one of the fortunate ones. But that kicked off what I refer to as my year of worst case scenarios, mm -hmm. where after my heart attack, 17 weeks later, after I you know, took a short term disability, they let me go at the clinic. Um, mm -hmm. They went on to go in a different direction. So here I am, recent heart attack victim. Now I lost my job during the Great Recession. Remember that? Yeah. And I was in Windsor across the border from Detroit. Not a lot of jobs. So it took me several months to find a new job, which required a relocation to Toronto, um, and which I, I took the role in April. So mm -hmm. it was several months of being on unemployment. Mm -hmm. Now, during that time, and you with your pharma background understand this, I had no drug coverage. So the medications I was on was costing me $1,000 a month. Wow. I'm, on, I'm on unemployment and now I've got this new thousand dollar a month bill to keep me alive. Mm -hmm. you, you don't get enough income to cover mm -hmm. everything else. I worked with all my creditors and they all gave us grace period, but unfortunately that grace period ran out. So in April of 2010, um, I was at my new role about a couple of weeks and then my oldest daughter who was 10 at the time mm -hmm. called and she's crying. And I was trying, what's going on? You know, I figured you know, she got in a fight with one of her sisters or something. And maybe, maybe they finally got tired and punched her in the nose or something. I don't know. I said, why are you crying? And she said, they took the car. Uh, the bank had come and repossessed our family vehicle. Because wow. again, we ran out of time. Right. Uh, and now they just started a new job. But the plan was, okay, let's start getting back up and start paying our bills again. Yeah. But it ran out of time, unfortunately. Yeah. So, Fast forward uh, to early May, found a place to rent in Toronto, move the family up, get everything set up. And then we realized we left the bunk bed ladder back home at our old house, uh, which we were getting ready to list on the market in a couple of weeks. So I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to go back down there and visit my brother and family in a couple of weeks. And then I'll swing by the house and grab the ladder and anything else that we left behind. I'll go walk through the house again and see if there's anything else. So I had a good visit with my brother when I went down there and I went to the house and I opened up the screen door and I saw the largest padlock I've ever seen in my life. You can't buy this padlock at Home Depot. The wow. only place you can get these locks are from banks and organizations that foreclose homes. Wow. And there's a small sticker on my door that said foreclosure. Wow. So, so over 369 days, I had a heart attack that should have killed me. I lost my job during the Great Recession. My car was repossessed and my home was foreclosed all in a year. And it was all because I was burned out. Wow. My, my burnout led to all of those things. And what's going on right now during mm -hmm. this pandemic yep. has triggered me a little bit. I, I caught it and I recognized why I was feeling the way I was feeling. Mm -hmm. It was because I see the potential of this happening to a lot of people. Oh and it, scare, it scares me yeah. um, because I know what it's like. But... I also know that you can get through it. And that's why I do the work that I do is because yeah. I learned how to recover from burnout. And more importantly, I know how to prevent it. Awesome. And, and that's, that's why I do the work that I do. Uh, and you know what? That's amazing. And I think it's so important. We understand your backstory and your connection to it because, you know, it's, it's easy to talk and make recommendations, but when you lived it, and you knew what worked, what didn't work. And doing the postmortem, you can reflect and go, these were all the things that led to this. Helps people who might be on the brink of that. So now talk to us about the statistics. You had mentioned before a little bit about 
um, the rise of burnout in the pandemic. What's that about? Well, there's a couple of statistics. I shared the monster.com survey and I've seen other surveys. There's one in the UK that uh, uh, organization that I'm familiar with and have had conversations with uh, Journify. They have an app, um, but you know, their studies are, you know, close 75 to 80% of people are burning out. But an interesting study that came out in the spring from NordVPN, so they monitor internet traffic and provide VPN services and whatnot. They said Americans on average are working 20% more hours than they did before the pandemic started. When I first read that stat, I thought, okay, who found the 27 hour clock? I want one. I need those extra three hours a day. Where did they find that? But basically what had happened was Americans, you know, their commute time, you know, varies between yeah. 45 minutes to an hour and a half each way. Some people have really long commutes. Right. So what had happened was instead of getting up in the morning, getting dressed, getting cleaned up, making coffee, then commuting to work and then taking that time and commuting back home, mm -hmm. people were getting up in the morning and they were starting to work. And they worked all day and into the evening yeah. up to maybe before they crash into bed mm -hmm. and do that. So that they, they traded their commute time for working yeah. time. Right. And then toss in the fact that so many people became full-time school teachers because yeah. they had to educate their children at home. Even right. if there was online classes, there was still the in-person uh, you know, teacher to kind of make sure that you know their kids were actually staying online. And the challenge of all of that, and then of course you've got your your loved ones if you're married or you live with a partner or friends, they're at home as well. Mm -hmm. So you've got all of these nuances going on, and it's really added a lot of stress uh, and burnout in the situation. And there's a lot of ingredients, you know. Of course, you know the challenge of trying to navigate through all of these hurdles. Mm -hmm. So many people had never worked from home before, so they didn't have any, you know, equipment at home. Mm -hmm. um, they may have had a laptop potentially, or they may have only had one computer and some organizations would provide some, some maybe not. And right. so there's all of those navigation, a, you know, side note, a big concern of mine I have is how many people are going to need physiotherapy after all of this, because most people are not working in ergonomic settings at home. They're sitting on their couch or, yes. you know, in bed or yeah. at the dining room table. So their arms are elevated like this. So there's going to be a lot of neck issues and shoulder issues for people because they don't, they were not designed to work at home. And as this prolongs, I, I, I hope that people will take more steps to make sure that they do things uh, from that aspect, but you've got so all these ingredients. Go ahead. Yeah, Michael, I just have a question for those who are, might be asking. So like, can we fundamentally define burnout? I think, you know, you just mentioned the point that people are immediately working, they're expanding their work hours. But what is how would you define burnout? I define burnout as a state of prolonged emotional, physical and mental stress that is not addressed. So it starts off as stress mm -hmm. and it's prolonged and you don't address it. And eventually it turns into burnout. You're emotionally drained. You're fatigued. You're overwhelmed by your workloads, life yeah. situations. Yeah. And it just, it just piles on and you start seeing, you know, the signs of it of course are, bad sleep. Um, maybe you're more irritable than you used to be with people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, you're kind of in a fog. You, 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 you don't have clarity about anything. If yeah. you're at work, you're starting to make a lot more mistakes. Um, right. you're, for, you're forgetful mm -hmm. and even making simple decisions and, and, and choices become almost insurmountable. Even to the point of, you know, wanting to know what are we having for dinner tonight, although that's a common one that we all struggle with. But even simpler decisions, you, you just frozen. You can't you can't make any decisions because you're in this state of just overwhelm and fog and numb, quite frankly. Yeah, I think, too. I mean, one of the things I teach in my resilience webinar is the point of self-reflection. Because we can become like the frog in the water where the temperature is slowly becoming turned up and you, you just don't realize it. All of a sudden you're like at the brinking point. So I think honestly, 
when you mention all of those symptoms, what I'm thinking is, are people checking in with how they're doing? Are they reflecting, how am I doing? Instead of like getting to that point of extreme burnout, like you, you hit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, a lot of people aren't. And I'm a big fan of journaling uh, because it allows you to get out onto paper what is going on in your life today. And if you do that every day, you can look back and see where you're at and you can check on your mindset and what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, I know a lot of people um, use a gratitude journal uh, mm -hmm. and I'm a firm believer in doing that. My, my journal is, it's a combination, both electronic and handwritten. I find handwriting and I know there's been studies where if you handwrite things, for example, your life goals, hand write those down there's something about that that's quite frankly magical where you're more likely to accomplish those goals if you hand write them than if you type them there's there's something to it um, connection maybe but for me i mean journaling okay how are my day is going things mm -hmm. i'm looking forward to uh, experiences and also keeping track of a food journal and what i eat because and and how i sleep and I know there's apps and I know yeah. the app, Apple phone and or the Apple watch and all other devices are, are starting to keep track of that, which is great. I love the use of technology and those kind of things because you want to track how you're sleeping. And if you didn't sleep well, you got to ask the question, why? What's why? going on? Was it every stress, night? overwhelm? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and for me, you know, food is one of those things. That's, that's, you know, one of the things that we consume, we consume information, we consume food, the air we breathe, all of these things. And if you're not sleeping well, you know, look at all the things that you're consuming to figure out, okay, what components are they playing in my inability to sleep well? And we, we found, you know, I, and I know a lot of people, you know, you know, mentioned that, you know, they didn't sleep really well the night after the or the night of the recent presidential debate mm -hmm. uh, and it's like well yeah because things that were said and done behaviors and whatever um, impacted you it doesn't matter what political fence you're on um, yeah. it impacted you and it was at night so you went to bed and you're doing that so a lot of people probably look like zombies the next day because they were tossing and turning from consuming that i didn't watch it yeah. um because I knew that it was going to be a circus. I just knew it. And I figured I could get the information the next day on what I needed to read. And exactly. I, just like consuming junk food, like I did, you know, prior to yeah. my um, cardiac event, consuming negative news, which there's no shortage of it. You can yeah. find it constantly. You're just, you're eating bad things. You're consuming bad things. It's going to take a toll on your stress. Prolonged stress leads to burnout. And we've been in a very long, stressful period with this pandemic. It's only been a little yeah. over six months. Yeah. It probably feels like six centuries to many people. Uh, it, yeah. But it's, it's been six months. Yeah, um, it's a long time. Yeah. And before, before we went on the air, you and I were, were talking a little bit about, like, you know, I, I like to, and I'm totally with you with the, with the consumption of media, the consumption of the news. Like I, I am like, turn it off. You don't need that. Even if you don't think you're listening to it subconsciously, you're hearing it. So just like turn it off um, and choose what you assume. Don't allow it to be pummeling at you. Um, thing that we talked about before we went on the air though, was how COVID has like sort of forced us to do an inventory, pause and reflect, right? I think right. once things started to shut down in the spring, everything was being removed from our calendars. And for someone like me, I was overscheduled. I had my days were scheduled, my nights were scheduled. I was so overscheduled, I didn't even realize it. So that forced me to really reflect and go, oh, do I really need all this in my life? Do I need to be overscheduled? Do I want to live here? Is this what I want to do? So I think, you know, this could be a great opportunity. What do you think around reflecting on what matters? This is a crucial opportunity for us, you know, using a car analogy, you know, growing up in Detroit, you know, I, I don't use too many auto analogies, but in this one, it makes sense. It's this is the time to really tune up our cars and our cars are ourselves and, and to take stock and go, okay, let's look and see where things are and, and ask ourselves, 
in a non-judgmental way, of course, because we have to love ourselves. That's mm -hmm. so important. And so many people beat themselves up for the decisions that they've made. Yeah. It, it's all a learning process for all of us. We're all going through this and learning new things and challenges. Some things work out great. Some things blow up in our face. Yeah. The, the key is to go, hey, I'm doing the best that I can with the information that I have at this moment. So you got to love yourself. But look and see where you are in life and ask mm -hmm. yourself again in a non judgmental way, am I happy and fulfilled with where I am right now? And if you're not, then ask yourself, well, where do I want to be? And this is where writing down your life goals and goals that you want to do both in your work, your personal life, whatever, right. writing these things down and figure out, you know, as I said in our, our pre-show, you know, like Steve Jobs told us, you know, where do you want to be? And then work backwards to where right. you are and then fill in the blanks. Will that journey be a straight line? Not typically, but you'll get there as long as you keep focused on where you want to be. You know, me launching my organization, you know, is the organization where I want it to be right now. I'm, I'm pleased where things are. Do I want things to improve? Of course. And I know the steps that I need to take in order to make that a possibility. And it's the same thing with anything else that we do, but this is an incredibly important time for people to do this and to see where they're at both mentally physically you know if they're spiritual spiritually and and take stock and and again focus on how much you've done and and this is something i i, I try to share with people all the time is we're going through this pandemic right now and many of us are working remotely yeah we never did that before yeah. Um, grocery stores have implemented safety measures. Organizations have created panels and dividers and working remotely and utilizing tools. As a society, we're still working. We're yeah. still doing things. We're still making things and products and services in the middle of a pandemic. Yeah. We should celebrate that. Yes. Does it suck that we're going through this? Of course it does. But look how much we've accomplished. Look where we're at. If you're vertical and you haven't, you've been able to avoid catching this you know, horrible pandemic, be good. You're, yeah. you're doing you're doing it right. Continue doing that. Yeah. And because in celebrate the fact that we we've navigated through things that no one was prepared for, right. but we, but we stepped into it and we leaned into it and we accomplished a ton of things. And yeah. we're, we're, we're going to be better for it at the end of it. But again, this is an opportunity for people to go, okay, what do I want to do? Do I like this? Do I like where I'm working? Do I like this career? Do I want to do something different? What does it look like? Now's the time to take advantage of it. Yeah. I, I say that to people when they go, you know, I'm just really having a hard time. I'm like, would you give yourself grace? We are living through a pandemic. Like give yourself a little grace that it's not easy and we're all doing the best we can. I mean, at the end of the day, you have to, you know, be gentle with yourself because it's, it's, it's definitely extraordinary times. I think the other thing, you know, we also, we had a candid little chat before we went live about, you know, working for the sake of working for the sake of making money, collecting new things, getting bigger, better things, and and not really reflecting on what where your values and where your where your goals really are. We can go into this autopilot for and become the next, you know, I guess like the the next person who needs the bigger thing, who has to have more, who, you know, and before you know it, you are a slave to an excessive lifestyle and you can't think about you can't think about anything that you truly love that brings you fulfillment because you're so shackled to this in this what you've created so it's uh it can be very confronting i would think for for some people to go you know i'm doing this i'm successful but my heart is over here um and i always say honor your truth like get connected to what matters because you can do it all day long if you love it you know otherwise yeah. Otherwise, you're doing something you don't like and it could lead to burnout. And I think that's, I think burnout is tied to you not doing where your what your heart is and what your purpose is. Uh, one of the things I love to say is burnout is a choice. And I get people mad at me about that. And I, oh you know, it's, it's like, it's like, it's like, 
you, you chose burnout and they go, there's no way I chose burnout. I'm like, yes, you did. Now you didn't say, you know what? In 2020, I'm going to burn out. No, that's, that's not what I mean by that. It's like your choices, your beliefs, your thoughts, your patterns, your habits all create the scenarios that can create a condition of burnout for you. And you can choose differently. And so many people, and I know we talked about this in, in the pre-show, probably should have recorded that too. But anyway, uh, <laughs> it, it, it happens all the time. I get it. You know, I'm, I'm being a host of my own show. Believe me, I get it. I'm like, oh, man, we, we should have had that. I click record as soon as it went on. Yeah. Uh, but what happens is, and, and many people are facing this, especially with the economic situation, if you're two income or three income or however many income household, and there's a dip in the, the revenue that's coming into the house, all of a sudden you're having a difficult time making that mortgage payment for that house, or you're working in a job that you don't like uh, because you need to maintain that income level in order to live in the house that you've always wanted. But the thing of it is, you have to ask yourself, are you really enjoying that house? Is it a, a comfortable place for you? Or are you focusing so much on how much you dislike your job? Yeah. You don't have time to enjoy the house. Right. So you, the, again, going back to what we talked about a couple of minutes ago, this is a time to take stock and realize, okay, I would rather work in this type of environment in this kind of role, but that's going to require me to take a cut in compensation. If I take that cut in compensation, I won't be able to live in this house. Right. Well, then get it, it. You have to. You have to look at it and go. Are Are you enjoying that house? If you're not, because most people aren't. Um, right. They think this is this is the house I wanted. They get it and they can't stand it because the payments are so much. I, and they they end up despising the house, which is their quote unquote dream house. Right. I tell people it's like in that situation. Find your passion. Okay. Yeah focus on that do that the money will take care of itself but it may require you to say okay i'm mm -hmm. i'm gonna sell this house i'm gonna move to some place or you know into a smaller property in mm -hmm. order to be able to live within my means and not be so focused on hating my job because once right. you enjoy the when work you do yeah when you enjoy that it has a ripple effect and a positive one yeah. on every other aspect of your life where you get relaxed, you get more comfortable, you're more fulfilled. And when you're more fulfilled and relaxed and calm, that's when clarity shows up. And when yeah. clarity shows up, you have the opportunity to come up with ideas of, you know what, I could do this too. Or right. maybe I want to launch my own business in this, or I can help out in this. And when people do that, what ends up happening in many cases is things start getting better. They start generating more income in different aspects. And then they end up making more money than they did before in that lousy job. Yes. And then if they want, they can say, you know what, now I can go you know, buy that dream house again. But oftentimes- Different terms, different, different scenario. Different yeah. terms. And, and their values have shifted. And they go, you know what, actually, instead of this, I want to do this. Right. And we're seeing this right now in the pandemic because a lot of people, when they were quarantined, mm -hmm. they- realized either a their house wasn't big enough for them or they had too much stuff or yeah. a variety of things so i anticipate that there will be a lot of homes going on the market because yeah. people are going to want to move to something either smaller or bigger yeah. uh, maybe they'll be donating or giving away a lot of their stuff because they're like i don't need this stuff right. and it's you know i talk a lot about boundaries and having boundaries in your life one of those things is material boundaries so what have things in your life that you truly need right. and want right. um, and serve you purpose. Because if, if you don't, then you're just taking up space. And that's why like the storage industry is still a booming industry. There's so right. many people right. that have storage units ah. and it's because they're <laughs> storing stuff that they don't use. Like yeah. when was the last time you used that? Yeah. You know, six years ago? Yeah, exactly. And and I think that's why I connect with you, Michael. I see the work you're doing and I get that it's not a job for you. It's your passion. Mm -hmm. And and that's what I'm doing. Like that's what I'm doing with my company is I want to make a difference. I want to use my story to end suffering. Like there's deep fulfillment in that. You know, mm -hmm. it's not it's not a sure thing. It's not financially stable yet maybe it will be but and it's it's got its own host of anxiety but it's fulfillment it's truly what my heart wants to do and i think that's why i connect with you because i get that's where that's what you're up to is you're up to 
I don't want someone to deal with what I dealt with. I want them to know what to do to navigate this. Are you, as a podcaster, I have to ask this question. Are you a fan of Joe Rogan? I, you know, Joe's an interesting cat. Um, I've, 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 I've been familiar with him for a long time, you know, before, you know, the television shows, yeah. before his yeah. own podcast. Yeah. Obviously, you know, he's been associated with USC for a long, long for time. Long time. You know, he's, yeah. you know, he, he's a dynamic individual on things yeah. and, he, and he's got, you know, his opinions and he's got a platform and obviously yeah. Spotify thought highly of it. So it's exactly. like, yeah, here, 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 have a ton of money and, and, and talk for <laughs> several hours. The reason, uh, for, go ahead. Go ahead. No, it's just no, the, reason, the reason I mentioned Joe Rogan is he interviewed a wonderful man. His name was Naval Ravikant, okay. where Naval talks about how we get into a job and we become an expert and we keep climbing that job's ladder and become more and more of an expert. And it's like climbing a mountain. You get halfway up the mountain and you look down and you go, oh, it's really far to go down. It's really far to go up, but I've come this far. I'm going to stay committed to this and I'm going to keep going, even if you're not happy. And Mm -hmm. what we don't do, he talks about, is we don't have the courage to go back down the mountain and try a different path and and go where our heart is or expand our knowledge. And the thing I love about his message is, like, we all feel when we get this identity in our jobs and our corporate jobs or in our, in our careers that we're married to it and that we have to keep going, but you really don't have to, if it's not bringing you fulfillment or joy. Right. Right. Exactly. There's so, you know, gone are the days of, you know, people staying at an organization for 25 years, getting the gold watch and the cake and congratulations on your retirement and, and all of that. It's right. because those types of situations, one could argue, was never the right thing to do, but it, it, it depends on the individual, you know, yeah. for you know people that were fulfilled and they enjoyed the work that they did. And it's, and then mm-hmm. it's good for me. My original career was public accounting, and then I went into accounting management, then IT management, and then healthcare executive, nonprofit management, and then launching my own business. So I've done a bunch of things. So I've climbed up and down several mountains, you know, and, wow. and you get to the top of the mountain. Well, you know, an example I use sometimes is I climbed up on the mountain, got to the top and realized, oh, wow, this is the wrong mountain. It's the wrong mountain. And, and, yeah. and he's like, and you laugh and you go, yeah. Hmm. All right. Well, I guess what we'll look. Oh, oh, there's a mountain that looks like yeah, it might be a fun mountain. We'll, we'll try that one. And yeah. the thing of it is, you can switch careers. You yeah. can do all kinds of different things because it's your life. You right. get to choose what you want to do. Don't delegate that choice. Mm-hmm. And with all this happening right now with COVID, and will we be working remotely all the time from now on, or is it going to be a hybrid, or right. how does work look? there's opportunities for people to choose a path that works for them. And again, that ties into, okay, maybe if I choose that path, I won't be able to afford this house, but I I'll have fun and enjoyment all day. For for me, it's like, I want to enjoy life, do the things I want to do, experience the experiences I get to experience and enjoy them from a point of, you know, as long as I'm living in a decent place that is affordable, Mm -hmm. comfortable, convenient, all these things, that's what's important to me. It could be be completely different to somebody else. And I don't have to think about it. And I can just focus my time and energy on things that bring me joy and fulfillment and excitement and, and, and everything else. And it's, it's a subtle shift. I know a lot of people may think that, oh, that's such a big change. Yeah, it really, yeah. it it's really isn't. Yeah. It's just a, a shift. Even, you know, if you're upset about a situation or something's upsetting you, it's like, well, um, either look at it from a different perspective or think about something else. Right. I, it's well, sometimes we get trapped in, oh, I have to think about this situation or right. we have to deal with this or it's like, you can think about whatever you want. What um, 
I want to ask you this as we slowly start to wrap up. I want to ask you, you know, for that person who's out there working, um, finding themselves working excessively because they have the convenience of working from home. What are some of the things, what are some of the immediate steps that people can do to alleviate potential, potentially burning out? And you mentioned a few earlier, but like, could you wrap it? Could you sort of like wrap it in sure. a package and say, this is yeah. what you should do with, this is what you should be looking for. Yeah. For me, if, for those that are working from home, it's crucial to have a schedule start and end to your work day. Even if you have to break it up instead of a you know, consecutive eight hour shift, it might be a couple hours here, hour or two break, a couple hours here. It, you got to be careful not extending too long into your day, mm -hmm. but stick to a schedule. Of course, if you're working for somebody, then get buy-in from them, explain to them the benefits of that work and, and those work hours mm -hmm. and stick to it. Then that way you have time to be able to do the other things, if, especially if you're a parent and you're educating right. your kids, you build those things in. Yes, your quote unquote end of work day may be later than five o'clock like it was before, but we hope that this will be uh, a temporary situation and eventually we'll get to the next normal. So make sure you have a scheduled start and a scheduled end of your work day. Think of Fred Flintstone sliding down the dinosaur the tail, dinosaur. punching out, <laughs> yabba dabba do. Well, right. the big problem is we don't punch out, mm -hmm. you know, from, you know, my first job had a time clock. So I punched out at the end of the day, my work day was done. Now it was yeah. at a grocery store. Yeah. Can't really do grocery work at home, at home unless I wanted to, unless I wanted to face the cabinet or something <laughs> like that, which would have confused yeah. my parents, but you know, but so that, that's the key thing. Number two, if you can, and, and again, employees have a lot more say in this than they think they do, as long as they you know, communicate with their bosses and, and get buy-in and, and demonstrate the benefits of it is do your best to try to establish themes for your, your day. So in my work, of course, is a little bit different. I'm not working for somebody per se, but in my work each day of the week, I have a theme of what I work on those days. The reason I do that is because it conditions my brain to know, okay, on Mondays, I'm working on speaking opportunities or following up with event planners for speaking engagements because I do mm -hmm. a ton of speaking. Mm -hmm. On Tuesdays, I use for intro calls or follow-up calls with people. Mm -hmm. Wednesdays tend to be my podcast recording schedule day. So when I do my show, I tend to record on Wednesdays. Mm -hmm. It can vary and blend over. Sure. And then Thursdays and Fridays, and again, this is months out, I block off. Now you're saying you work a three day work week <laughs> wish. No. Um, but I leave those initially blocked off. So if something comes up yeah. that gives me an opportunity, like our conversation today, mm -hmm. I had time. And yeah. so, so often, and you, you mentioned it before where prior to the pandemic, you, your calendar was overcommitted. Yeah. And it's a, it's a big challenge for a lot of us is we overcommit to things. And again, we don't want to beat ourselves up, but, they're all good things, but we have to have boundaries around what we choose. We can't do everything. So we got to really get crystal clear on what we find is important. Uh, another thing to do is frequent check-ins with all the stakeholders in your life. So that means your bosses, or your employers communicate. Now is the time to communicate more. Although zoom fatigue and burnout is there too, but right. establish some check-in times also with your family. And your kids, how's everybody doing? Because again, during this pandemic, we're all struggling with some things. Yeah. Even even the best of us have struggles with this. It's not a fun time, but do the check-ins on that. And again, going back to the themes of your days, I color code my calendar. And you can do this with a paper yeah. calendar or a digital sure. calendar. Mm -hmm. Color code it. But for your self-care time, which is things that you know, bring you joy and fulfillment. I'm not talking necessarily about yoga or meditation, but if you do yeah. that, great. But things that you enjoy doing, whether it's you're going to coffee with friends, lunch, going for nature trail walks, which I did this morning, whatever the case may be, schedule that in your calendar, put it in there because it's important. Work will have no problem filling your calendar. Yeah. But you need exactly. to schedule your self care and the things that benefit you first. Don't yeah. put, don't wait and try to find that seven minute increment in between calls to do yoga. Yeah. Don't, I mean, if you can, you want to do it. Awesome. But 
when we try to find times in between the work, we'll end up skipping it. So yes. book the, the, the self-care first. And, and, and when you color code it, make sure that your self-care is your favorite color. Yeah. So mine is blue. So I can look back at my calendar for the last month or the last quarter. Uh -huh. And if I don't see enough blue, yeah. that's a problem. Yeah. So then I go ahead and I, I, I increase the blue on my calendar to make sure that I'm getting enough me time, uh, which is the whole thing. We Life is lived to be lived and not to work all the time and not do the things that we enjoy doing. Because if you can harmonize those things, your life's so much better. Amen. Amen. Michael, thank you so much. So if somebody wants to get in touch with you about the work that you're doing, um, I have mm -hmm. it on the ticker on the bottom, your website mm -hmm. to reach out to yep. you, Breakfast Leadership. I think it's uh, breakfast, breakfastleadership.com. Mm -hmm. Any other way that people can reach you, maybe LinkedIn or... Yeah, LinkedIn. I'm on all the social media platforms. It's usually under B, the letter B, Fast Leadership. Okay. Um, or if you look under hashtags, Breakfast Leadership, you can find me that way too. But I'm on Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn is where I tend to spend most of my time. Um, Facebook, you know, all those places. Yeah, uh, reach out. I'll be more than happy to have a conversation with you uh, to help uh, people avoid this burnout pandemic that uh, is definitely, like I said in our pre-show, it's a pandemic within a pandemic. And uh, I, we want to eradicate it from our world so we can live the, the ideal life that we want to live. Fantastic. Thank you so much for being on uh, Michelle's Conversations That Matter. And I look forward to following you con and continuing to support what you're up to because I, I know that together we're going to make a difference and uh, be well, my friend. Thank you so much for the time. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. Bye-bye.